When you listen to the interview that I did with Katie Matisson last semester, um, where she's talking about fake news, one of the things that she mentions is this idea of certain kinds of group polarization that can happen. Um, we've all heard of uh, these kinds of stories about sort of like the wisdom of the crowds and the sense that sometimes groups can actually be more successful decision makers than um, sort of, you know, like individuals in like sort of just acting alone. And so like we've heard the example of the marble jar, right? I think we all probably may have done that in elementary school, right? Where some like, you know, your teacher holds up a jar of marbles and then asks everyone to guess how many marbles are in the jar. And the answers usually range pretty, you know, kind of widely, but sort of cluster around certain kinds of numbers. And the teacher will sort of like add up everybody's you know, everybody's guesses, and then take the average of everyone's everyone's guess. And it turns out that that's usually actually really, really close to the actual numbers of the jar. Um, the idea here being that like groups of people, you know, like it's important to listen to others and like groups are more accurate than individuals who are, are making choices on their own. That is a really interesting phenomenon and it does happen in some cases it really only holds true when every member of the group is more likely to get an answer right than with say chance right so if you were to just imagine that like somebody just sort of like pulled something out of their butt they weren't even thinking about it um that that person you know or like just sort of like by chance um it has to be the case that the group is a little bit better than chance like each member and it has to be the case that the groups are diverse and kind of distinct like they can't um, like if you ask, you can ask them about the questions of the marble in the jar and even if they're kind of similar you know they don't have feelings about the uh, like opinions again like about the, the marbles in the jar it's not like everybody is, has this reason to suspect that there's less marbles than anybody would normally think right like nobody has these ideas um, like preconceived ideas about the numbers of marbles in a jar that would align in one direction so in that sense, like the, this is like a really great example of exa like examining the ways in which some groups of people can be, for some questions, more accurate than individuals um, who are making decisions in isolation. This changes, however, when groups of people um, are asked to weigh on questions about which they do have preconceived notions and when those preconceived notions are very similar. So if you take groups of people who have very diverse political ideas and you put them in a group and you ask them to sort of talk about a question, um, you know, nothing exactly really happens, but they do tend to kind of come together a little bit more, um, right? So they might like, if you had a group of people who were very politically liberal and very politically conservative and you put them in a focus group and ask them to sit down together and talk, at least it used to be the case that, um, you know, even if nobody, changed that much generally the trend in the group if you were to like measure their beliefs after like pre and post test would be a little bit more like to kind of come into moderation if you take groups of people who are say um, politically liberal and most all of them are sort of politically liberal on the spectrum and you put them in a group and you ask them to ask like to, to sort of discuss a question the group will actually coalesce along the most extreme position. That's true also of conservatives. Um, so it's not necessarily here tracking political beliefs. This is actually just tracking a particular kind of po like polarization that happens among people who have certain kinds of shared preconceived values or assumptions. Um, you get them together and you talk about something and rather than having the sort of like, you know, like people kind of coming together, they actually move all further in one direction. Um, a lot of people think that this explains a lot of why we see certain kinds of polarization and like increased political polarization today. Um, some people think that a lot of this has to do with the internet, but even if you don't have the internet, um, certainly we've seen a lot of sort of self-sorting and like a lot of people moving away from certain kinds of communities. And so, um, you know, like we definitely have this sense that people um, who live together tend to have really similar um, kinds of sort of fundamental political beliefs about things. And what you see, as a matter of fact, is just that like this actually increases polarization. So why is this significant to this discussion of freedom of speech, bots, and amplification? 
One, it's really important because it demonstrates the ways in which um, at least we have some worries that the structure of our society today really undermines this idea of the marketplace of ideas. Um, that actually, rather than thinking that being like at, like having access to a wide variety of perspectives or having access to other people's speech makes us better um, reasoners and makes us more likely to know the truth, there are some worry that actually what we have necessarily been doing is kind of moving ourselves into different kinds of information silos, um, which actually makes us more and more polarized. And so what you see is like rather than having people being able to come together, we have more polarization. Um, and this is true on a lot of a wide variety of questions that are not necessarily um, always sort of political too. So I think it's easy to think about this kind of stuff through a very political lens, um, but that's not necessarily, um, that's not necessarily only, the, the only way that this happens. So this is, I think, really interesting when we think about, you know, why it is that when you go onto social media, and why social media in may sort of like amplify this particular effect. So this effect happens um, like in focus groups that are hap that are in person. So it's really um, not necessarily about social media or digital technology in and of itself. But when you get groups of people say online, one of the things that people believe is that this effect is actually um, probably a little bit amplified. And the reason is because when all of us are accessing sort of like news information or the expression of other people through social media, we also have this sense in which we're being watched by a very wide audience, right? So if someone posts something to my Facebook page or like, you know, like share something with me, I am aware whether I sort of realize it or not that what I do or how I respond to this is in some sense being watched by other people. And that may change how I interact with the particular bits of content. So I may try to do kinds of like certain kinds of like social signaling, right? So I wanna say like, well, I like this person and I wanna be friends with them, so I'm liking it. And in liking this content, even if I haven't really thought it through, I'm sort of signaling not so much like, like it like ends up not necessarily much being about the content as it is about my relationships with other people. Um, and so in that sense, like I'm not like sitting in isolation, examining the arguments or like weighing in on, you know, like thinking to myself, like, is this really right um, as I'm engaging with content? Instead, it becomes this vehicle through which I am engaging socially with other people. But we also know that people don't always necessarily like are necessarily aware of when they're doing this. And if like sort of political affiliations or values associations or other kind like if it's if it sort of seems salient to me for my relationship with other people, um, I may end up just kind of relying on different kinds of confirmation bias or, you know, not really being able like not necessarily being receptive to sort of other kinds of contrary information. And so in that sense, it can be even more polarizing because if I do that and there's lots of other people who are watching what I'm doing because like they just have access to my feed and they're my friends, you can see how this would really start to increase the kind of polarization that you have um, because of the same mechanisms that make like in-person groups kind of polarize as well. And so that's one of the worries about this stuff with bots as well, because if you can get someone who pretends to be someone who is like you to drop something that's not true, it can be difficult for people to discern whether it is true or not, and they will like it. And then you have this sort of like seeding, like anchoring, of where the most extreme positions are or what the data points are. Um, and that can actually sort of um, hasten certain kinds of, um, of polarization. That may not be its intended effect. I mean, one of the things I think is really important about listening to Kay Matisse's, um discussion about fake news is that the vast majority of fake news, people don't actually have like a political agenda um, or have much care about what you believe or think about the information. It's much more like bullshit that's just intended to get you to click on something. Um, and after that, the people who create the information don't necessarily have a lot invested in some of the unintended consequences of what happens to that information afterward. 
And so I think that is particularly interesting when we're thinking about why it's why these kinds of phenomena are worse online or with different kinds of social media than they are with, say, face-to-face -face groups.